So uh, last, uh, last month we introduced a new section uh, to the end of the meetup, just a quick kind of round table discussion. Part of the reason we upped our mic game as well, just so we can have like several, you know, allow, allow for the quick back and forth comments. So we'll probably need a couple of people standing around with the mics as we get into this. Uh, as a bit of a follow up, so last month we had an introduction talk um, to NPM, um, which is a package manager in the JavaScript world. I'm sure many of you, if not most of you, are familiar with it. Um, so just kind of following on the idea of, of package managers in general, um, whether it's in like Ruby on Rails, uh, whether it's whatever, whatever environment you're working in, um, we just wanted to kind of talk about some um, best practices. Um, so yeah, we're going to probably spend about 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes on this. Uh, I don't want to keep everyone too late because the talks are a little bit longer today. If it fizzles out sooner, cool. Um, I have way more questions than we'll have time for, so we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, so when you're going out there into the world uh, and you're thinking about um, like you have a problem you're looking to solve in your code, uh, when do you decide when to check if there is an existing package which solves a, a need you have for your in your code? And like maybe what's too big that you wouldn't want to bring it in, or maybe what's too small that's not worth bringing in and maintaining independency. So, this isn't really an answer to your question, but it's tangentially related, mm -hmm. is whenever you decide what's too big and too small, I think it's really important to evaluate the code that you're actually bringing in as a package. Um, it's not uncommon to see a package which will basically wrap a native function, and that's all it is, or maybe they'll have a whole bunch of complexity that wraps a native function, and you can be like, oh, I don't actually need this package because JavaScript Core SDK just provides what I need. So I think it's really valuable when you're looking at a package is actually looking at the code for it and being like, what just, how is this doing what it's doing? Which can maybe help evaluate whether or not it's too big or too small. Yeah. Or if you need like one function out of underscore, do you need all of the underscore library? That sort of thing. Okay. We can keep going through the slides if there's not, if this is not a burning question for anyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I kind of have an answer to like when to look if there's a package out there for what you need to do. Um, for me, it's if I'm looking at doing something, I'm like, oh, I should probably split out like a new code library, like a new file and start writing like some something bigger, like a utility for this or something. I think that's right away, you should go looking, even if it's something small, sometimes there's things out there already that do it for you. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess this is almost the same question in retrospect, but when do you decide to check if there is an existing package which solves a need? I think maybe we covered with that with the last one. Well, I thought that was the first question. Yeah, Sorry. I realize they're very similar in retrospect. Um, okay, so now you've found a package which appears to solve a need you have. How do you vet it? Um, or like if, whether it's the only one you find or ones if there's 10, what do you do? What's kind of your next step? Um, so typically the packages you'll find like on NPM where they have a GitHub repository. So you go to the GitHub, check how many stars are on there. Mm -hmm. Then you check the issues and you see if there's, um, if they're actually like addressing the issues or if there's like stagnant issues. And then you'll check the uh, pull requests and you'll see if you have multiple people submitting pull requests and seeing if they're all being accepted. Because if they are, then you know there's an ecosystem and people actually use it. Yeah, so you're referring to the uh, star counts, fork counts, watch counts, and uh, open closed issue counts. And the issue, yeah, the, the, the pull requests, yeah, you, you see a whole bunch of different names, that's good, because if it's only one name, that means it's just one person doing it. And as soon as he gets hit by a bus or something, you're done, or he loses interest. Yeah. Yeah. Does everybody know what pull requests are? I'm assuming most people you would not know what Cool. Sure. I think another factor is when you're on the GitHub page and looking at all those other things which are great to look at is look at when the last time this package has been updated at. Um, and sometimes if it's a really simple package, it's possible it's actually done. More often than not, if you just go over that. Well, I was looking at that. I mean, this is a, not the worst way to no, see. I just have a nice release. But <laughs> you just look here and see, like, this has been last touched. The top? The top is actually... Last commit. Yeah. Okay. So that gives you a good, a good sense of, is this something that maybe 
was really popular 75 years ago, <laughs> and then nobody's using it. So maybe it has like a million stars, but it's also just has never been updated. Any tricks for if there's like two good contenders, they're both well reviewed and oh yeah, um, same same question slide. Two right. things. So yeah. in, in light of recent React events, um, one thing is to look at the license mm -hmm. um, and make sure that you're not agreeing to any uh, surprising clauses uh, in the license by using that package. Um, like you build something around it, and you know they, you have to stop using it for some reason that can be really expensive. And then uh, the other thing is to look at who's backing. So again, example of React and Facebook and with Angular with Google, um, you know, is, is there a strong backer behind the project that you trust and trust will continue to maintain? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, I know another thing that I find that I look at a lot, especially if I'm working with a team, is what is the, the documentation and the support for the library like? Because you know, for smaller ones, you can just go and look at the source. But um, I find especially if they have documentation and it's not maintained, that can almost be worse. So one of the things I look at is, yeah, what is the documentation like and is it up to date? And does it actually you know, address things that I would want to be doing with it? It's really obvious, but read the readme. <laughs> Sometimes the title makes it sound like it does what you're looking for, but especially if you can figure out like what the interface is and what sorts of functions it exposes and things, then you can figure out if it's actually a good fit for the way you're going to be using it. Yeah. The readme also sets the tone for a lot of projects, like just seeing how coherent it is. And yeah, like if there's like typos in the readme, chances <laughs> are there's going to be yeah. mistakes in it. So it <laughs> Great. Yeah. So I was say one other thing I'm, I'm surprised no one said is um, if you actually look at the NPM packages and how used it is, like even if it's not very active on GitHub sometimes, if it is a package that a lot of people are using, that would make me think that it, it's maybe more stable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know maybe the fact that it's inactive just means that it doesn't have a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. I remember the website. Yeah. Uh, you guys, I think, know the count. But uh, what's, what's your favorite? Uh... Left pad. Left <laughs> 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 Express, I heard Express. <laughs> um, yeah, you can see uh, the count, the daily kind of stats, list of collaborators. Uh, README comes through here as well. This is maybe more of a personal thing, but are there TypeScript bindings? Um, <laughs> if you're using it, uh, like the IntelliSense that comes through the TypeScript engine is invaluable, so if, a packet, if one package has bindings and one doesn't, it's a big weight. Yeah. For front-end libraries, do you want to consider, like, can you consume it if you use, like, required JS or different importing strategies? You want to kind of make whatever your, however you kind of yeah, import and manage code. old enough that it won't, is it just <laughs> synonymous with all of them? It's probably, like, a warning bell. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know another thing too is a lot of projects will do this now where they have badges for their, their unit tests, but also things like their dependencies, whether they're up to date as well. So that's another thing that I'd look at just in terms of the quality of it is to see if they actually have tests and if they're updating their dependencies. I hope, so. yeah. This is getting so bad. <laughs> that's what it's for, I can be dropped. I'm really hoping my next one's about keeping them up to date because that would be a great segue. Go ahead. No. <laughs> no, I meant uh, like next. Um, this is something that I never do, and I don't think anybody else uh, does it because nobody else brought it up, but actually looking at the code is, like, I never do it, and I really should, because at a certain point, if you have some bug in it, um, being able to actually read their code and just not having their code be garbage is, is really useful, and there are certain cases where I have used a, a package and then regretted it because I have to, like, go dig through their monolithic function to, to actually solve the, the problem that I'm Good call. Uh, oh, yes, it was a good segue. How do you keep your packages up to date? <laughs> Greg? Um, in my NPM start, uh, I, have, I have made NPM start instead of just uh, starting up and compiled or whatever. Um, added NPM updated dash dash depth zero. And so every time I start it up, it tells me uh, what things are. At this point, it's a lot. <laughs> so you just learn to ignore it. Well, so the question, the question then is like, okay, so it's out of date. So what? Yeah. Um, but do you, you have to make that decision of like, does it actually matter that I update this, or 
Like, is it going to cause problems for me? Is it going to be much more difficult to upgrade in the future when I do need some feature that they have just released uh, versus just, like, I don't need it. It doesn't do anything for me, so just leave it. And that is really the <coughs> view as far as I'm concerned. Um, so quite recently, we upgraded from Ember 2.1 to Ember 347. It wasn't actually that big of a difference, but it felt like it. Um, so because we did such a big jump and it was a little bit painful, we decided to figure out how to keep our packages up to date. Because especially if you're dealing with a bigger framework, um, doing a whole bunch of upgrades at once gets really painful. Uh, so we found this tool called Gemmonium. Gymnasium. <laughs> People are thinking of Diamond Dillium from Futurama and pushing them together. Uh, anyways, so it's in this tool that will look at um, Ruby, JavaScript, Java, and I think some other languages, but I don't really care about the giant list. And it scans your project. Um, if there's like a gem file or a package file or whatever else, and it looks at what you're doing, shows you how out of date you are, shows you if there's open CVEs against how many of the versions you're using. So if it's a security vulnerability, it's like, maybe I should update this so, you know, uh, we are Equifax. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I had a similar experience. I updated from uh, React Native, I think it was 0.19 to 0 0.43, uh, all in one uh, session, and it was horrible. Uh, so maybe just a word of warning, if you decide to go with like beta software, Keep up to date. That that I could not stress that enough. Every point release that that, that comes out, update your code because that way when you have you, yeah you're forced to later on uh, you don't get burned. Actually, kind of kind of relate to that. Um, if you're doing like one of those big jumps, something that we have in place had in place and haven't done a great job of maintaining is the ability to actually have like two sets um, of uh, dependencies or, or libraries in, in like a gem file. And using the NVAR to be able to run in both modes. So if you are looking at trying to do a big version upgrade, you can actually, you know, like move back and forth between them and work towards it progressively um, instead of having to do like a major change like that. So that can help a lot sometimes. I'm gonna do a little terminology checks. This is the JavaScript meetup. Uh, gems are the dependency management in Ruby. So the gem file is kind of like the package.json for our Ruby project. All right, maybe one, one or two more, depending how fast they go. Uh, oh, do you work on, I wrote this terribly, do you work on or maintain any private packages? So do you kind of use like a private repo somewhere for managing your code? Who, who, maybe we'll do a show of hands answer first. Like who's uh, in their company that are using private repos or like a private package manager? Okay. Okay. And, um, yeah, um, in a bigger project that I'm working on, I found it um, maybe not necessary, but really nice. Uh, it was, it's a React project to be able to abstract um, some of the, uh, I can never remember the terminology, universal, polymorph, whatever type of um, components that are supposed to be working ac across platform um, and abstracting those out to their own private uh, NPM packages and being able to consume those in multiple front ends. Um, very selective about that, but when it works, it's absolutely beautiful. I'd also say it's way easier to do this than it sounds like. Mm -hmm. You just need a GitHub repo with a package file inside of it, and you're good to go. Um, and I think if you start down this methodology, it's going to save you headaches in the future. So um, if you think it's something you might want, just give it a go, and you'll be like, oh, this was really easy. Okay. Um, okay. We'll do this one really fast. Do you have any quick tips or tricks to share? One last little bit of advice you want to just get off your chest. Use less libraries. Um, <laughs> you know, most projects probably have libraries in them that are redundant and doing very similar things or solve the same problems. Uh, there's also been um, like there's some great stuff online like for libraries. Like this is a big thing in Ruby. Um, the standard lib does a lot more than most people think it does, and then they'll include libraries that do get things that they don't necessarily need. Um, so just trying to be like deliberate when you're adding the dependency, like every dependency is complexity, you do have to maintain it, you might conflict with other things, so if you can avoid adding a library, then it's one less thing you need to do. 
Um, I know one thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is um, globally installing things. Uh, like you'll see a lot of tools that are like, yes, install me globally and use me everywhere. <laughs> And it's like it's great until you know you have two projects that need different versions of it. So that's one thing I've definitely been bit by that. And now, if I can, I try not to install globally and get away with that as much as I can. Yeah, I definitely like executing out of the node modules in the folder if I can. Yeah. I hear yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> any any like does somebody have a package horror story where I went wrong, other than the Ember or the um, Ember upgrade and yeah. <laughs> well, having out of date packages is a given. Yeah. Um, I think it was last month or so. Uh, I was trying to install a package. I couldn't remember the exact name of npm, and I just tried a couple. Uh, just tried typing it out a couple different ways, and the next day, uh, word came out that there was fake packages in npm with common misspellings, and um, I had a bit of a panic attack there, uh, but I, I checked things really quick and I didn't make any terrible, terrible mistakes. And I think my code had like gone out to our production servers at that point too, so it was a little bit of like, oh shit. But um, yeah, definitely be careful when you're uh, including any packages like that. Like make sure you go to like npm, uh, what was it, npmjs.org and like make sure you're getting the right package name because sometimes these repos might have some malicious stuff in them. So you got as far as installing it, but probably not consuming it, or did it have like a Well, I, I ended up installing the right one, Yeah. because um, okay. I tried it like with the S on the end, and without the S on the end, and, and then it installed, and I was like, oh, okay, I, I think I have the right one, and then the next day I kind of had a panic attack and looked, yeah. and I did get the right one, luckily, but. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things that happened is if you're dependent on these, these libraries, a lot of play steps will actually like pull down and install the libraries as part of the deploy step. So it's not using the local install version, which is generally a good one. But it means that if one of those sources for like any library in your project is down, you know, so GitHub goes down or um, you know, NPM goes down or something like that, you cannot deploy your application. Um, so like fortunately like that's never burned me that badly, but it's still like it scares me. Just being aware that like anything like that could actually just like stop your ability to like deploy um, I guess this is kind of more of the tips thing, and I hope I don't mess this up. But uh, so one thing you can do is like, let's say you have your dependency, and you um, you have to make changes on that, but you're going to push that to a separate Git repository. Is you can symlink the node module folder to that to that other folder that you're doing your work on. So then you um, so then you're doing your actual changes outside your node modules, because I see people sometimes, they go into their node modules, they're making the changes there, and then they're trying to they get their manage it, but you can have it in a separate thing, you can symlink the files, and your webpack or whatever will detect changes and compile for you and everything. So, yeah. NPM actually has built-in commands to do that through like NPM link, or is it link? Mm -hmm. or it's like, mm -hmm. that's yeah, right. that will actually just do that for you, so you don't have to manually go into the sim links. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think, oh, yeah, that's probably the last, last answer here. Yeah, you can go for it. Yeah. Yeah, so. uh, I had, uh, like, I think a year ago or almost two years ago, like, horror story with NPM because um, I'm a Windows guy. So I wanted to compile packages and on NPM on Windows. But, like, C, uh, it's based on C++ from, I think, Python. So it compiles different from on Windows and different on OS. So I had a... Uh, so, like horrible like two days to set up environment on Windows 10 to yeah <laughs> to, <laughs> to 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 set up that and I found some like advice on some forum from lady from Microsoft and she said that I should like uh, install I, I don't remember right some, something like Visual Studio C++ something libraries yeah so basically it ended up like I need to reinstall my Windows and then install this the way that it should be. And now it's working, but not, not every time, because sometimes like when you want on a specific version of SAS compile uh, in Gulp, in, in NPM, if you want to compile something, it's like uh, uh, giving you errors, so you need to uninstall this package and then install it, but with a, in package JSON with a star, so like any version available, and then it works. So on Windows, like it's, Terror, terror stories. <laughs> yeah. And definitely packages that have binary, like that actually uh, compile a binary, that's probably what I've been bit a lot. It's like you upgrade your node version, and in, like in theory, your, your 
node modules haven't changed, but now like because it was compiled against an earlier version of Node, it like can't run. I had like also yeah, OS switches kind of bite me. Your production Ubuntu is a bug, but your Mac it's server really doesn't or something or Windows. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for uh, participating in the discussion. Just a couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, we would like to thank our what do we call them title sponsors? I don't know the our main sponsors for the season. Uh, Jobber. Um, quick spiel about Jobber from. Not sure. Side. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so Jobber, local software company. Um, we are born and raised in Edmonton, effectively. Uh, we uh, just have our office down in Jasper there. And we do software for um, small businesses, and in particular, home service small businesses. So um, home cleaning, uh, landscaping, and lawn care. Um, the core of the application is Ruby on Rails, um, hence the gem references. Uh, but we are you know, moving towards more and more, oh, thank you, um, more and more JavaScript in our stack um, in terms of backend services running Node, in terms of um, and, uh, JavaScript memory. So we are doing more and more JS. Uh, we also have uh, Investopedia. I'll throw the mic across the room there. Uh, I'll note uh, while the mic is way, making it way, its way across, uh, Investopedia, uh, just like last month, will be uh, buying the first round of drinks for those who head down to the uh, Mercer Tavern. So thank you for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Investopedia, we started in Edmonton in the late 90s, actually. Um, we've had a long journey since then. We've left Edmonton and our development has just come back. So we've got about 40, 50 developers in Edmonton. And we started as a simple uh, online dictionary financial services and it's grown into a lot more into Apple News, um, Cloud Academy, site online now too, so we take courses and all kinds of new stuff to get into. So. Thank you. Uh, thanks also to Startup Edmonton for providing us the space every month and also uh, our meetup.com profile as well and the exposure that gets us. So thanks, Startup. Um, our next meetup is November 2nd. Uh, in general, for the season, uh, we're still looking for speakers. So uh, if you have something on your mind that you'd like to, you know, lessons learned or um, things you want to kind of share back to the community, uh, we would definitely appreciate it. Uh, we're trying to add some new speakers into the rotation this year as well. So if you haven't been up here, we're a friendly crowd. We're not, hopefully not too intimidating. Um, I, standing here, I don't feel intimidated by you all. So, um, but yeah, we, if you're interested, um, you can like reach us on Twitter or just have a chat with um, us after the meetup here today. Um, I actually just, I don't know if it's even live yet, I just set a URL. If you go to exchangejust.com slash talks, it'll take you to the spreadsheet that we use for managing our talks to you, so you can just put your name on there too. Nice. It's the easiest. Yeah. If you have a request for a talk to you, we're always, well, uh, it's always good to hear. Uh, so the hack up slash code night, so I've been starting a rebrand on, on the hack up. Uh, again, that's Wednesday, October 18th. Um, the format of that is like from like 6 to 8 p.m. We just uh, hang out and kind of do one of three things. Um, so we've started to add a component to the meetup where we're going to be like learning or building on a talk from the, the month. So in this case, we're going to play around with some GraphQL together and try to learn, learn it better together. If you already know GraphQL or just want to do your own thing, you're welcome to just come and like, maybe you have like a project you just never get around to and just want a good excuse to work on it for a few hours. That's what uh, Code Nights are really good for as well. Or if you want uh, maybe to provide some mentorship or be mentored, you want to just come and maybe ask some questions of a JavaScript uh, expert, um, that's a, a good good way to learn as well. So uh, October 18th at Jabber, the, it's already, I posted up on Meetup uh, just at the start of the evening here. Uh, already discussed that. Uh, we're on so the socials, uh, and yeah, drinks. Uh, so I think that's the last slide. Thank you, everyone, everyone, for coming out. Hopefully, we'll see you at Code Night. If not, hopefully uh, in November for our next month. Uh, thanks for uh, also like one of the last 18 degree evenings probably we'll have. Really appreciate that you. Uh, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, before like the next November is. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Thank you, everyone. ExchangeJS is Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. Thanks to our sponsors, Jobber and Investopedia. Support the meetup and like and share this video. And stay informed by following us on Twitter and meetup.com.
links in the description. See you soon!